Hello and welcome to the latest episode of MVP Buzz Chat. I'm talking today with Dan. Hello. Hello, Christian. How are you? I'm doing well. And Dan, for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? Uh, yeah, my name is Dan. I'm uh, based out of Denmark. Um, and I guess I'm a little bit of a do-it-all guy, a Microsoft 365 focused. So SharePoint teams uh, come from a development background. I do a lot less development than I used to. Uh, but at the same time, I, I try to get that in there. Um, so obviously with the recent times, focus on Copilot and all that stuff. I think we're all going to be co-pilot MVPs. That's what I think Microsoft is is gearing up towards. The other thing is, too, it used to be that you really could focus in on one area, one product. I started as a SharePoint MVP. It's hard to do that now because we do. We touch so many of the different products. Um, so there's a lot of cross-pollination. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing I found, too, is like whenever we, we onboard new developers, we sometimes get them, they've maybe never touched SharePoint, they've never seen Microsoft Platform. And they'll go, okay, so I'll create a team. And then you'll go, yeah, but do you realize what that's doing behind the scenes? You're not creating a SharePoint site. You're not creating a Microsoft 365 group. What is that? Like all those things interact in a way that's just like complex. Well, that's the, the welcome to the life of people who care about governance. You know, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I used to always t say that, tell this kind of this, this, this example, the story is uh, for, for a solid year, I was living in Sacramento, California. I was commuting on a motorcycle. I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to do it. I own this thing. I, the, I, my, I would get on the freeway, one exit. It was very close to, to commute. Did that for a year. At the end of the years, it's starting to get cold. I had a jumpsuit that was weatherproof that I'd put over my work clothes uh, I parked my motorcycle and it got crushed. Somebody backed into it, ran over it while it was parked. Thankfully, I wasn't on it. It was an accident. Um, but from that experience, what I learned is that I, as a car driver, I went back and bought another car and went back to that life, uh, is that I became much more aware, aware of motorcycles on the road. And I would always say, like, you know, it's almost I wish that they required people to learn to ride a motorcycle so that they would be more aware of motorcycles on the road. I, I think it's there's a it's a similar experience with with the governance pains, with a lot of the administrative, with developer pains of like the architecture of that is if you get people to go and experience that, if they have to build that, if they have to be involved in the governance and the the cleanup of these things, they're gonna be more aware of how they create, where they create, how they collaborate, um, the process involved with that. Um, I, I don't know if you experience any like yeah, that. No, how, how, no, how do you I, teach I, people to? I'd actually agree quite a lot because it makes a lot of sense that you're, you're more aware of things. And I think what we're seeing, at least, so, so I do a lot of stuff in the small, medium business company or sizes, which here in Denmark means 50 to 250 people. So really small organizations, which might have only have a single IT guy. And, and we're seeing a lot of this where the IT guy is like, oh my God, this is what I used to do. I used to be the one that created the folder at the root of the network drive. And I was like administering privileges. And th these users, they're creating teams all over. And we're like, yeah. And, and to some extent, that's actually good because you do want them to be collaborating. Yep. Um, I always tell people a... sprawl is good. It means people are using this. The, yeah, there's work to be done. And there's smarter ways to do it. But sprawl means people are using it. And you want, those are good problems to have. You, de you definitely want sprawl to, to some extent. Like, and you want to be able to, I think the biggest problem people are facing is how do I like know what's going on? Because you go into the active teams thing and there's just a list of hundreds and hundreds of teams. You can't see who's a member there because you have to go over to your enter ID and you can look, oh, okay, these are the owners. Oh, wait, there's no owner. There's no like unified process to, to get that like governance perspective for the IT admins who don't understand that a team equals a SharePoint site. They'll see a SharePoint site that takes up 100 gigabytes. They'll go delete. And suddenly everyone's <laughs> running around screaming like, what's going on? 
yeah, that's uh, it, it. It's a fun life. Is that? Uh, do you focus at all on governance as a topic? I mean, what are you what are you uh, writing about? Or, or actually, what what is what are your primary contribution types? Let's start there. Yeah, well, let's start there. My primary contribution types are um, community code samples. So I do a lot of SPFX um, yeah. and share those out in the there are some sample repositories. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really my main contribution type. Then I have a block where I write whenever I come across something like where I go, whoa, this is this is not how I expected it to work. I'll, I'll put that there so I remember it for later. Uh, I used to do that internally on a SharePoint side. And then I went, well, why am I doing this only for me and a couple of colleagues when I could be doing it for the whole world? I uh, started doing that. And, and that's really my main contribution areas. Um, yeah, So and then I do a monthly summary like pretty much everyone else does where I do, hey, these are the 10, 15 things that stood out to me this month. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably my, my primary contribution areas. So I know no speaking or anything yet. Well, that's see, that's it, it. So this that's not a unique stance too. I, I think it's a lot of people that come in to say, like, look, I'm not speaking at events around the world. I'm not that kind of person. I'm not a prolific blogger, writer, things around that. It's like, do I still have a chance? Do I have to do those things? And I think something that, um, so a good friend of mine, fellow RD and MVP, Sharon Weaver, and I run a monthly call for people that want to become MVPs. And we just started a quarterly uh, call for new MVPs that are like, hey, now I'm an MVP. How do I get the most out of this experience kind of thing? And, and one thing that we talk about is that it's a, it's, there's no one way. There's not a checklist for becoming an MVP. It's yeah. it can be very different. And there are people who are hardcore introverts that just the, the, the idea of getting up and speaking in front of a, a group of people just scares the heck out of them. And it's like, no, you don't have to do any of that. There are, there are people that become MVPs who do nothing but answer questions on uh, forums. So, yeah, I mean, this is somebody, I can't remember who told me like a while back when, when this whole thing was sort of getting started that you have to remember you're, you're just counting counting really contributions and all that matters as a contribution is you created value for someone else. Like that's really what in the end somebody is looking at is, hey, someone here is doing something that's helping others use Microsoft products ideally. Um, and that's like, that was to me, oh, okay. So that means whenever I answer someone on Twitter when they have an issue or I answer someone on Reddit, that's theoretically still a contribution. Yeah. Like just, just being out there helping out, which I guess was what we were all doing it before anyways. Well, the hard part for a lot of people, this was an adjustment for me years ago too, was like cataloging those, keeping track of those things. Because I, 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 the, most of the stuff that I do, I'm not thinking, hey, I'm doing this because this would be a contribution to become an MVP. It's like, no, I was doing it because somebody's asking a question. I had experience with that. I shared that. I'm happy to do that and network and connect with people around that. So in the future, like, hey, no, maybe we can work together. Maybe you have some information that, that, that can help me. Um, and, and so thinking through that process of, okay, how do I capture this? How do I catalog those things? Yeah, I'll, I'll say on the development side, that's pretty easy because I just go to my GitHub and I like get a CSV file of all my pull requests and I'm good to go, but yeah. For sure, that's something where it's like you go through and you're like, well, I did actually help out at that conference. I volunteered to help because, hey, I got to go to the conference for free and I got to help out a little bit. And that's one of those things where I'm like, oh, yeah, I have to put that in as well because that's also helping out. And that's also a valid contribution. Yeah. Oh, well, years ago. So I do like you do. I mean, years ago, I, I was working for a company. Uh, so before I became an MVP, I started people would ask me, it's like, OK, what? You know, what have you been doing here in the last month? And and I started, I was the chief evangelist for a software company. I started sending out a little internal newsletter of like, here's everything that I wrote. Here's the conferences that I was at. Here's all the things that I did. And it merged, it kind of moved to where I was tagging all of my content in the CRM platform. So if they're talking with the customer and they'd see, oh, our evangelist just wrote this article on that topic here, let me send you that, that, that kind of thing. But then it evolved into what I do now is a monthly blog that outlines, here's where I spoke, here's where I've been, here's what I wrote, here's the videos, all that collected all in one place. 
So as we were talking about just before we started recording, the annual review renewal process for MVPs, I have 12 blog posts of the, the previous year. I go back and look at, I know exactly what I was doing. Otherwise, I'd be looking through my Outlook calendar a year ago. What was I doing in yeah. April of last year? I, I set up a, uh, a Microsoft list because just, that's just what I'm used to. And I did that like whole filling in and like grouping them and trying to, to get an overview of what's going on. How, how much am I doing? And, and then you sit there and you go, I'm not doing enough to ever become an MVP. And then like somebody said, well, I mean, we can nominate you and see what happens. Because yeah. I think that's the, the common thread I'm hearing whenever I'm talking to other MVPs is they'll always go, I'm not sure I did enough to get renewed. Yeah. Like, and then I'm talking to, to a couple of people where I'm like, well, someday I'm going to nominate you. Like you should start tracking and they'll go, no, no, I'm not doing enough. I'm like, just when you put it into that list and you see how much stuff you're actually doing, it's, it's always kind of like, okay, you, yeah. you forget a lot of stuff if you're just going off the top of your head. Well, I know that there's on the other end of that too, there's uh, I mean, you, you need to remain humble because at the end of the day, it's a Microsoft program. Um, you know, we're, we're, we, we serve at their pleasure. No, I mean, we're, <laughs> <laughs> that phrase I just wanted to use. Now we're we're uh, I mean the things that we're doing it is kind of a black box and and so their needs or their their the, the people that they want in the program could evolve and change and and even though the volume of the things that I do may not change they may say you know it's not the types of activities that we want anymore and and so I, I look at it like I'm not doing it for that it's a great it, it's it's the uh, the cherry on top of the things that I do it's great to get the recognition be part of the program at the end of the day i'm going to still do the things that i do because these it's my hobby it's my passion i've always been a community guy yeah and i think that's the attitude you need to go into it with it's fine to say hey i've got to focus i'd love to become an mvp i want to do more of those things but you have to figure out what are the things that count towards that that be, will be recognized by microsoft is community contributions but are the things that I do because I love doing this. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, I think the, in my mind, the, the best kind of approach is you just do whatever you do. And if somebody reaches out and says, hey, you're MVP potential, then you go from there. And sure, you might need to, to change a couple of things to, to be more in line with what the program wants, but you should really do, do it because you want to do it and you should already be doing it whenever it like starts coming to mind. Did you, did anybody provide that feedback to you? Of like, hey, if you only did these other things, did you change up anything? Uh, I would say yes and no. Uh, so so uh, I'm relatively new in the space, been in the space for five years now. Mm -hmm. and most of that was lockdown and COVID and stuff. So, so really didn't get to see much. The golden um, years, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so my first ever real community interaction with ESPC back in 2022, that must've been since so okay. November 22. Yep. Um, where I met a couple of, couple of MVPs. First time I'm ever meeting anyone that's MVP. To me, they were these like mythical creatures living online. I'm like, who are these guys? Um, and that was in Copenhagen. And uh, so they were headed to Tivoli Gardens and I'd been there before. So I just tacked along started talking to them and it ended up like he went to a share gate party and it was a great night and, and uh, at the end of the night i'm like you guys are just just regular folks like flesh and blood that's right <laughs> yeah and then there's a uh there's a, a whole thing going around and it's sometimes that it, it comes up again in the the circles where on that road trip or on the trip back from the party mm -hmm. we're in a taxi and i'm on the front seat and then there's three mvps in the back seat and they're just all three of them struggling to get their seatbelt buckled. And I'm on the front seat trying to explain to this taxi driver. So, you know, these guys, they are like the technical pinnacles of the Microsoft world. <laughs> and they're just screaming from the back seat. I can't find the hole. What's going on? <laughs> I know. Uh, there, there's a great couple of photos uh, of the people in the vehicle making fun of a fellow MVP, Alistair Pugin and I. Um, we were in driving, doing a road trip in South Africa and one of the windshield wiper blades came off. And so we were trying to reattach it. And it took like 
15, 20 minutes. We couldn't figure out how to get the thing. And so they were inside the car laughing at us, taking video and photos of the two of us sitting there trying to figure out like that. So yeah, it's uh, hey, we're not experts in all things, okay? <laughs> no. I think that, that was, to, to me, that, that moment right there was just like, oh, the, these are actual people and I can just walk up to them and say hi. And I mean, that's really what you should do. Yeah. Like those people you've seen online, just if you ever meet them at a conference, go up and say hi. Like I've had that happen a couple of times where someone will come up and say, hey, nice to meet you in person. I'll be like, amazing. Like, because you always have the best chats whenever you're like face to face and just casual. Yeah, always. It, well, I, I say this thing too, is that especially if you have interest in being part of the program and Microsoft is, is getting, I, I'd say a little more aggressive on trying to find new people. Not that they don't like their, the, the MVPs that are in the program, the people that have been in the program for a long time, but they're constantly looking to refresh the ranks or expand the ranks. In fact, there's, I, I don't know the number. I don't know if you know the number of MVPs. It's like, it's over 3000, might be like 3,500. 3,500 is the number I've heard as well. Yeah. Um, and, but I, there's no cap. I, meaning if they find people that have the appropriate, you know, community activities, you become an MVP. It's not like they're saying, oh, so we're, we're full up. Um, so if you're interested in becoming an MVP and you, you are doing things, reach out to a, a, an MVP. Dan and I would be happy to talk to you about it. Um, what, what it could do, talk to you about your contributions. I've had people just like, can, can you look at my profile? I said, from looking at LinkedIn, looking at your Twitter uh, account, I can't really get a, a good solid sense of that. Let's have a conversation about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, so, so cause you keep mentioning it on your podcast, which it's always fun. It's like the, the time from whenever you're awarded to the time where somebody asks you, how do I become an MVP? I, I just checked. The, the first message I got was six hours after I posted my email on Twitter. And then I've had a couple of people reach out today because I posted a picture of my crystal, which arrived yesterday. Yep. So people are already like reaching out and they're like, how do I become an MVP? And not, like you're saying, I'll look over your LinkedIn or Twitter profile or something. I'll go, I have a hard time seeing what you're doing, but but send me a list of where you are doing stuff and I'll help you yeah. promote that as well. Yeah. Because that, that's the thing, like when you're getting started, I remember I had maybe 10, 15 followers on, on X Twitter. And it's like, whenever you post something, it doesn't really, you get maybe one, two likes, but then eventually somebody picks it up and retweets it. And it will be like just rolling from there. Yeah. It, it's funny how uh, there was a study that was done years ago. Uh, so I, I'm a big social collaboration guy. And so, you know, going back to the late nineties, um, uh, there was a study that AOL did people like, you know, AOL, you remember, you know, AOL, which was, you know, huge at the pinnacle. And then they kind of, you know, fell down. They completely shifted their business model. They, they ended up buying like, uh, Huffington post and, uh, you know, a bunch of other tech sites and they turned into this, this, uh, again, they became very profitable. They grew and, but quietly in the background, people didn't uh, were aware of this. They did a bunch of research. This is about eight, 10 years ago is a while back, but they were looking at and studying what helps make normal content go you know, viral, not viral, like suddenly two days later, millions of views, but, but where people pick up that it gets a, a healthy level of engagement. And it's when uh, it's not just like likes are not as strong of an indicator as you think it's the interaction engagement when people comment on things. And what's funny is that if no one's commenting, Nobody wants to be the first to comment. If you see a bunch of conversation happening, you're more likely to jump in. So they actually did a study on that. And so that's why if you want to get attention out there, you're writing good content, you've got 10 followers. But if you start responding to other people that you like, commenting on that, and are writing something and at mention people. I mean, LinkedIn is incredible for that. Write an article, post it up there and say, this is very similar to an article that Dan wrote you know, a week ago on this topic. It inspired me to go and write this. If they pointed to you at that based off of something you wrote, you're more likely to jump in, review it, comment on it, share it with your network and you get that network effect. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's also a... a... I don't want to call it like a, a a prestige level to it, but 
whenever you see somebody repeatedly answering other people's question, whenever they post a question, you don't, you assume, okay, this is actually a question where they are not doing something wrong. Like it's not a basic question. It's, it's, oh, this is interesting because I thought this would work. I want to go and, and investigate this. Like I'm way more driven to help out people who I know have helped me in the past because mm -hmm. you get that familiarity where you're like, huh, I know, I know that Christian usually knows what's going on with groups. Why is he saying this is an issue? Like yeah. it shouldn't be an issue. I'll go and test it on my tenant. Whereas if it's the first time I'm seeing you post, you just created your profile. I might be more likely to go, nah, I'm not going to spend the 10, 15 minutes I need to do to replicate this. Right. Um, well, that's why it's, it, 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 people do move it, you know, in circles that they're familiar with. I mean, we do that. I mean, that's just, Hey, that's life. That's the way humans work. Is that if, if I know you, we have this connection. I mean, this is the fact that we've done now this recording, you know, and if something comes up, we may, you know, for, for a while, we're going to see each other more within the social feeds around that, but we're more likely to engage and get a better sense of what you're working on. If I've got questions around SPFX, I might reach out, Hey, Dan is somebody I should go get an opinion on for this thing. Um, yeah. I mean, you, and that, that's... you need to, you need to take that step though, make those connections and reach out to those people. Absolutely. And, and that's like, you know, that's, I guess that's how it is. Like you'll learn, you've got your struggle. And sure, in, in my circle, there's a lot more people who do SPFX than there might be in yours. And then those gaps in between those circles is what I find makes the whole MVP program really magical is that I know, oh, governance, I can reach out to, to Christian. Like you, you get those pinpointers to people who, who aren't working with different things than what you normally do. Right. Well, nobody can know all the answers to anything, uh, but I know somebody who knows the answers. <laughs> I know people and collectively they know everything. Yeah, um, you might even know people in different time zones as well. Right. Like that's something I've come across is you're really struggling. This is a like serious issue. You need result now. Being able to reach out to someone maybe in a different time zone because maybe it's late at night in your time zone. Yeah, not, not a maybe. I don't I don't work with many people in my time zone. <laughs> that's the thing. All of my the people I work with are in other time zones. So uh it's why I don't sleep that much because <laughs> Uh, you know, I, my, I work with companies in Europe. I work with people and companies in my network in Asia Pacific. And the problem is I'm in the mountain West of the U S and I don't know many people that work in, in uh, time this to space. just shift your own time zone. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I just work on that. Well, you know how they say that like there's you know optimal times to, to post content, like on LinkedIn, I was like, well, at like uh, 11 a.m. I was like, yeah, but it's always 11 a.m. somewhere. We work yeah. in a global community. I'm like, what does that even mean anymore? But yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess because I, I do see it whenever I post something, like it will come in like a bunch of Europeans will like, and then later on, like it will move around the globe. Yep. You, you can see that pattern, surely. But well, there's a longer a conversation audience. around that too about doing social promotion. You can't go, you write a blog post, you go tweet it out once like that should not be the end. You should have a strategy where you're going in with different tweets. Again, this is a longer conversation because this yeah. is, so I do uh, marketing strategy. I do fractional CMO work for mostly ISVs, but in the Microsoft ecosystem. But a lot of it is that, no, your strategy should be for every new blog post. There's a minimum of four social posts for that single article. They're all different. Sometimes with different images always at different time zones is because it's a global community and you're hitting those, those different areas. There's right. something I have to go and work on. <laughs> yeah. It's well, there's, there's so much to be learned there, but well, Dan, Hey, hey I've got to run, but I really yeah. appreciate your time. And I know we'll, we'll talk more. We'll, I'm sure I'll see you at the uh, MVP summit next year. Absolutely. For folks that want to get in touch with you, reach out to you, where are you most active socially? Where can people find um... you? Um, probably on Twitter. Uh, I'm active on LinkedIn as well, but I do post in Danish there since the majority of my connections on LinkedIn are still Danish. So, so but the translate button I've heard works great. It does uh, work very well. So uh, assuming you can, I uh, can take a little bit of uh, bad humor in Danish that is roughly translated. That's also a place to reach out. Um, but yeah, Twitter is for sure where I'm the most active. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for your time and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Talk to you soon. Wow!